I'm so glad to see everybody here. And this, I'm introducing Wise Owl again. Wise Owl is an old man that has been uh, 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 communicating with me for several years. And Wise Owl, I have to let you know, does not consider himself an African American. Wise Owl said he's an African in America. He said, now, when he, along with other people of African descent, have all the rights and privileges of American, then he will be an African American. But until then, he's an African in America. Now, he's glad to be here. You know, he's all right with being here. <laughs> but but he, he also more glad that he's a stone cold African. Um, what I, uh, I had someone else, as you can see on there, to uh, sing the um, Black National Anthem. But I'm going to call on uh, my longtime friend, very versatile man. Uh, I'm not going to stand here and try to introduce him to you because you already know him. Uh, Brother Robert Kofi Hickman. Hotel. You know, I I, it's, I I make the mistake sometimes of um, uh, saying "hotep" and not sure everybody knows what that means. Um, what it means uh, uh, is a lot of things if you're a peaceful and loving person. Uh, but it suffices to say "hotep." It is an African call and response. It says peace and love to you. Hotep. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> a lot of folks say, why he get Bobby to come up here and sing the song? He, Bobby don't know nothing about no singing. <coughs> but the, the, the brother Carter will be introduced later on. He can probably remember one time when I snuck up on the stage. But, um, you know, I... I'm a little overwhelmed. Uh, uh, this reminds me of the first time I saw the rainbow. And I'm sure when you first saw the rainbow, what, you know, the, ooh, this is not the brother down the street pain. So uh, I, I'm a little, little overwhelmed. Uh, <coughs> it's so nice, though, to be in this kind of a setting. Uh, I guess Wise Owl told Kwame, he said, man, you ought to quit lining people up and, and having them all sitting in a row. Kind of circled around so people can see one another and look in one another's faces. And this is a wonderful atmosphere. I mean, we can look and see one another uh, and talk straight to one another. This is, this is beautiful. Well, I... Um, <coughs> Oh, I'll just tell you this. I was at a basketball game, and they uh, asked everybody to remove their hats and stand up for the uh, national anthem. Well, I stood up, but I didn't, you know, take my hat off. Uh, it wasn't to be disrespectful or nothing. I just, you know, that's what I had on and didn't feel like removing it. And so uh, <coughs> somebody came to me later and said, uh, I noticed you didn't take off your hat when they said the uh, when they did the national anthem, and uh, you know I, our system of thought had me thinking real fast. I said, "Well, you know, uh, I I was reaching up to get it, but I didn't hear uh, lift every voice and sing, and I was a little bit confused, so I just left it on my head." <laughs> boy, boy looked at me and said, "Oh, but that's all good." But anyway, uh, uh, um, hat on, hat off, what happens is, is that uh, we need to sing this song. Uh, and, and thank you for saying, we'll sing along with me. I have to tell you that quite often when we, uh, no matter how often we do uh, our, the Black National Anthem, when we get past the first stanza there, we kind of falter. 
and generally uh, people have, you know, they have the, the thing there so that we can kind of sing on with it. Well, <coughs> learning uh, early in life that it's better to be telling the truth, I'm not all that keen after we get past the first stanza myself. <laughs> so you can sing, you can, you can get me to sing it with gusto till we get to the second verse. So I'm, I, now if anybody here knows it from the point I take it, come on with it, right? <laughs> all right? Just, just, just being honest, all right? What, what's that? Is it just, yeah, I'm just saying. Okay, uh, so would we all please stand? <coughs> <coughs> Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies let it resound loud as the roaring sea sing a song full of the faith that the rock fast has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory is won hotel Okay, first of all, I'd like to introduce um, all who are in other classes. We've been giving this award out since 2001. And with everybody else who has received uh, the Kwanzaa Award, uh, please stand up. Um, we are in the, what we call NIDCAD building, mm -hmm. and I uh, want Brother to come up and, and talk about NIDCAD. You have to excuse me, because uh, my mind is almost 80 years old, and it don't keep up with my feet. <laughs> Giovanni Ford. Well, Hotep, everybody. Uh, raise your hand if this is your first time in NIDCAD space. First time? First time? Well, we always like to welcome our first time visitors with welcome to NIDCAD, welcome home. We've been waiting on you. All right? So we mean that this is home, right? We are the network for the development of children of African descent. We're a family education center that focuses on literacy and cultural enrichment for the purpose of building unity in our community around our children. Our babies belong to us. And their successes and their failures rest with us. So it's about how do we strengthen our ability to do for us for generations to come. And so when we say welcome home, we mean that, right? Being connected to community, to family, is a choice for us. And we each have to consciously and intentionally decide to be connected 
and through institutions like this one and our other African cultural institutions, that's one of the ways that we can choose to stay connected. So welcome to NIDCAD, welcome home. We're so grateful to have you in our space and uh, we want you to enjoy yourselves, make yourself at home. As Elder Kwame said, you see the food back there? The cheese is starting to curl up a little bit. So make yourself at home. Hotep, everybody. <clears throat> It has been my honor, uh, Kwame said, uh, yeah, Bobby, uh, I'd like for you to uh, uh, speak on the elders. I had to look at him a couple times to see if he was trying to signify something. <laughs> but uh, I thought, well, you know, come on with it. I'll do that. So here I am. Uh, and I, uh, I want to... Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, uh, give uh, an award, uh, speak for the award for a person who, uh, who tried to wait us out, but the dates kept changing and he finally had to go. But posthumously, we'd like to award uh, 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 Mr. David Nins and his wonderful wife uh, 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 the Lifetime Award. Here was a man who, uh, who was helpful in ways a lot of us have no idea. I mean, he was kind of like on the ground helpful. Uh, uh, strong man, uh, knew who he was and was <coughs> satisfied with that and wasn't going to be nothing or nobody else. And, and he had a way of helping people who a lot of us might turn away and say, no, go ahead on, man, I ain't trying to hear that. Uh, he knew they were in some kind of need. He also knew their backgrounds and so forth. Uh, just a quick, quick example of what I'm talking about. I would go by there and see him, and there would be maybe two or three uh, dudes who had eased in off the street looking to try to get some money for this or that or the other. And uh, <coughs> he knew it. And I'd come in looking all sideways, like, well, you guys are again trying to whip the old man. Mr. Nins was 90-some years old, right? And yet he was, he was, uh, had his wits about him, as they say. And um, uh, so he, I'd say, what's going on? And he'd say, uh, well, these gentlemen here came uh, saying that they wanted to earn some money. And um, uh, so I told him, well, yeah, I got some work around here you can do. Uh, so um, they sat down and wanted, waiting on him to tell them what they could do. Uh, he said, but before we get started, I want to tell you a story. Uh, that was sometime in the morning. It was sometime 4.30 in the evening. And he was telling them, he said, now, <clears throat> my wife's out here to pick me up, so you're going to have to come back in the morning to hear the rest of the story. Uh, but Mr. Nin, we thought we was going to earn some money. He said, well, I'll give you a little something because, you know, you haven't done no work yet. And, and when you come tomorrow, I'll finish up these stories and you can get the rest. And, and, and I, would just, I would just sit there and say, oh, the wisdom of this man. Uh, Mr. Nins was a heck of a, a person who uh, you'd see around the neighborhood working. He was a, a what, uh, what, what pla more than a plasterer. Uh, well, he did uh, general. general contractor. And you'd always see him working uh, around the community, and he'd always have people who you wouldn't expect to be working nobody's job working with him. You know, but that was the kind of helpful uh, in, in dealing with people in need he was. And so a lot of people didn't necessarily know him by his deeds. He wasn't always in the paper and so forth. But if you did know him, you know, you would uh, have his memory implanted on your heart. This was a good man, a strong man, and uh, he died as strong as he lived. I would then uh, want to uh, the, uh, uh, ask Maurice, his son, to come and receive for him his award. And incidentally, his, uh, this, his wife, Cordelia, uh, who stuck by this man for I don't know how many years, was always there encouraging him or, or, or just doing whatever he said needed to be done. Maurice, did you want to say anything? Yes. 
You know, I was uh, up to the kitchen today, and uh, a young man came in looking for my dad. And I said, well, you know, he passed away, you know, about a week ago. And he was so, you know, he, he was really broken up when I told him that. But he had told me that his dad had died years before and that my dad gave him such wisdom and helped him. And that was the life of my dad. He helped young men. He trained young men. He taught young men how to work. He taught them how to work hard. He taught, he, he taught them how to be disciplined. And he helped a lot of guys. And so I really appreciate this on behalf of my father and my mother because he helped a lot of people. And I thank you. Well, I could tell a whole bunch of stories, but this is not about me. So, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I, I do need to uh, to say just these few words about the uh, next person, who uh, who uh, has made an imprint and built a dynasty in St. Paul. Um, <clears throat> when I got uh, discharged from the service <clears throat> in the middle of the '50s, um, I came home and I had come home from New York. Naturally, I thought I was hip, you know, hey. And, 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 and coming back to St. Paul, I, I knew there wasn't nobody as hip as me and, 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 and knew about some jazz and all that kind of stuff. So but my, we used to ride around in the car, and I'd sing songs. And so we went to this club one time, and, and as soon as we walked in the door, we hear this sweet music. And, 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 and so we went on in there, and... And they had a little thing where you sign up with like if you want to go up and sit in or sing a song or something like that. Well, me, I hadn't sung with no bands or anything like that, so I wasn't going to embarrass myself. So, so uh, but somebody snuck over there and put my name on the list. Somebody was in the, in the crowd or the car we was in. And so uh, they called me up. And so I goes up and I tells the trumpet player, I said, uh, and I ain't never sung for no band before. I don't know nothing about none of this. He said, young blood, just go ahead on and do what you know. We got you. And I made it through a song and did another one. You know, this was back in the days when I was chirping Nat Cole and Sinatra and Sammy Davis and them kind of songs. And, and they act like they knew me real well and I was with the band or something. And I never will forget that. And every time I see Mr. Melvin Carter Sr., I think about that time. Uh, him and Irv Williams and uh, Percy Hughes, and, and I'm not quite sure if it was Perry Peoples or who was on the drums. But uh, who was it? Perry Peoples. Perry Peoples, okay. They were on the drums. And, and here old come cocky me. But when they, they, he, he said, well, come on, son, and go uh, uh, young blood and sing your song, I did that. Sorry, I didn't follow up on that. But more than that, uh, Mr. Carter was just telling me about uh, his father's relationship with my father and, and my Uncle Larry. And uh, uh, I didn't know about that. So I'm more than honored uh, to, uh, to know about the connection. And, but more than that, to honor a longstanding brother uh, who has made contributions going to sleep in this community. Uh, uh, Mr. Melvin Carter, Sr. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Brother B Bobby. Am I coming through here all right? Yeah. All right. It's, it's a great honor to receive this award, and it's kind of unexpected, but unexpected, too. And to see so many black people who are, who are going in the same direction really moves me. You don't see it too often. I haven't seen it, and I've been here for, I was born and raised here, down in the old Rondo community, where we had a, such a comfortable community until they disrupted us and moved us all over the planet. And we had uh, churches and, and stores and uh, everything a person wanted right within that Rondo community. But that was a, that's history now, and I think we're beginning to build something here again that I haven't seen in about 50 years. And it's going to be nice when it all comes together, starting with this place. So I'm very glad to receive this award 
and I thank you all for coming out tonight, and, and uh, good luck, everybody. Hold tap, everyone. Hold tap. It's great to be here and great to see everyone. Um, and I want to join and say thank you also for coming out, and thank you to the wise old owl for uh, bringing us together under circumstances like this. I'm Atum Azahir with the Cultural Wellness Center, and I have the honor of um, uh, presenting to someone who is, who, whom I've known actually, I don't see him. I have known uh, this young man all of his life. I mean, um, when we um, started to, when the young people started to come to my house and hang out in our basement and um, challenge me um, on issues that were important to our community and to themselves and try and talk me into letting them have um, curfews longer than what their mom and dad had said they needed to have, that's when I met uh, Brother Mark. But I want to say that I've watched him uh, over the years. I have seen him grow. I have seen him come into himself. And in these past few weeks when he was uh, notified that he was going to receive an award, uh, what his question was is, what have I done to deserve it? And of course, as elders, we often have to say to, to, to young people, nothing. <laughs> It isn't about whether you deserve it or not. It's about what we see in you that has potential for the people, for our people, for our community. And Brother Mark has worked very, very hard to fulfill the potential and to fulfill the expectations that all of us have in him. Um, he came back to the Twin Cities, as many of you know. His mother and father um, and other family members, um, uh, including his children, um, Brother Mark had gone off and uh, built a, a, a career for himself in finances. Uh, he came back to visit. Um, he was, um, at, and then decided that he was going to stay here, uh, come back home, um, if you will. I also had a conversation with him during one of his visits and said, I don't know if you've seen the Cultural Wellness Center recently, and I don't know if you've given any thought to what the Cultural Wellness Center offers, but I'd like you to give some thought to what we're doing and how you might contribute to it. And I said to him real straightforwardly, we don't have any money to pay you, but I certainly want you <laughs> to be a part of the work. And because, he, because I said we didn't have any money to pay him, and he didn't turn his head and walk away, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this is what I need to see, this is what we need to see. This is what we need to have in our young, up-and-coming, hard-working people. Brother Mark, uh, I think, went on a trip and for a few days thought about this idea of the Cultural Wellness Center and the work that we were doing and the fact that we didn't have any money. But he called me, and lo and behold, we got a contract just about the time that he called me. And we got um, um, a request from some people, uh, Elder Kwame, uh, Elder Mary Kane, others to come into St. Paul, and just about the same time that we started to think about coming into St. Paul, Brother Mark was ready to take the position. So he is in the right place at the right time on many occasions. He thinks about his life and the, how it's connected to the people of our community. He listens to what the elders tell him to do, and he really and truly is the greatest studious stu student uh, one of the greatest students that we have. He reads the books. He reads the books of Kepra. He studies the words. I mean, he is really a great student, a student of life and a student of the teachings of our people, has the greatest vocabulary. And as a matter of fact, it's my understanding when he was in high school, often people teased him because they thought that he sound, um, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but what but what we know is that it is a standard of excellence that Brother Mark has established for himself, for his mind, uh, for the work that he does for his people, and we are very, very proud of him. He works very hard, 
and he is the future leader of the Cultural Wellness Center. And I thank you, um, Wise Owl and Brother Kwame, for giving us the opportunity to present him to you tonight. Brother Mark Robinson. <laughs> All right. Well, like my brother did last year, Brother Komet, I had to take you to take a little, take a little page out of your book there. Um, you know, really, I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to write. I didn't. Uh, it, it is very true that I didn't anticipate accepting any awards, nor did I feel like I deserved any awards. But, um, Hotep, may the ancestors guide the words that I say to you this evening. I am because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. It is with humble apprehension that I do accept this, word, this award bestowed upon me in my name, but I accept on behalf of the work and the foundation laid by our ancestors and our elders. I had to write it down or it wasn't going to come out right. It is because of the collective work of all of you in this room and all Africans who have toiled and are toiling for the liberation of our people now and into the future that I accept this award once again. So Kefra, Kefra, Keferu. My special and sincerest thanks goes to the elders who have guided me and nurtured me through my flaws. Thank you. To my brothers and sisters with whom I work, we may not always see eye to eye, but we push through anyway. I am filled with gratitude, humility, and hope because of that. Hotep. Shemsu Atum and Seba for continuously stoking the spiritual and the spark of my cosmic intelligence. Love has no greater gift. Thank you. And for all of those of you that have known me since I was small or smaller or not even here, my family in the room, my cousin Michelle, thank you for being here. Um, and thank all of you all for, for allowing me to accept this gift in your names because it is because of you that I am accepting this gift once again. So thank you, Hotep. Hotep. It's great to be here with you tonight. I have the honor of bringing to your attention one from our community, a beloved son who has done very, very much work on behalf of this community, our state, and even our nation. He is a son of Rondo, and so I want to bring to the front, while I speak of him, Mr. Peter Bell. Thank you. Thank you. I just want Peter to stand before you as I talk a little bit about some of the work that he has done. You will know him most recently as the past chairman of the Metropolitan Council. Now we know that the Metropolitan Council is responsible for regional planning and for our transit system and for negotiating many, many large projects for us, including the Central Quarter. So we have heard and read a lot about that work as it has proceeded. I can very shortly tell you that Peter has been on the leading edge of a grand piece of work for our community. And he has been negotiating the challenges and the opportunities in that work. So much has been done and so much remains to be done. The foundations of the work have been led by the Metropolitan Council and Peter Bell over these past four years or so since the Metropolitan Council received that work to do. It's big work and it has been engaging many of us in ways in which we have never been engaged before. I think when Peter first took the role as chairman of the Metropolitan Council, he said something like, he had to negotiate many different avenues, including probably informing 90% of the people for whom this regional planning work was done and assuring and engaging another 10% that the Metropolitan Council was the place and the method for getting it done. Well, since you took that work, I know that all of us and Peter has observed that the lines between those groups has really been getting muddled, and that's good. 
because what that means is that we have all recognized the great significance of projects such as this, and we, together with Peter Bell, the Metropolitan Council, and many other local government organizations have become so much more involved in that work. I want you to know that that may represent the most visible piece for us recently, but that Peter has been about the business of serving community for many, many years. He has been the founder of the Institute on Black Chemical Abuse, which has served this community by engaging resources to support people in the challenge of overcoming chemical abuse. Peter has also led work at the Hazelden Foundation, I believe as Vice President of Publishing for Hazelden. And it is my understanding that Peter is going to be returning to his roots in that work and has already begun plotting his way toward that work. And we know that we continue to need resources and assistance and to be uplifted in ways that will help our people to overcome chemical abuse and the very many other illnesses that are a part of our lives. Peter, I congratulate you on the work that you have done. I look forward to your continuing service to this community and to engaging you as a resource continually as we move forward. And I have the pleasure of presenting you with Wise Owl's Kwanzaa People of 2010 in the area of Kuji Chagulia, self-determination. You have truly, truly uplifted that principle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. It is a real pleasure for me to receive this award tonight particularly from Commissioner Carter, who, uh, Commissioner, I really enjoyed working with you over uh, the last four years. You are doing a great job of service to the community. I was pleased to see that you were a, a past recipient of, of one of these re uh, awards because your service to the community has really been awe-inspiring, and it's really a deep honor for me to receive this award, particularly from you. You know, there are some recognitions that you get that, that quite candidly are, are more deeply felt and meaningful than others. And, and awards that you get from your own, from your own community, are really heartfelt ones. Uh, as been said, I am a native of this community. I am 60 years old and was born uh, a really a stone's throw uh, from here and have spent my entire life uh, uh, in this community. So it is something that is near and very dear to my heart. Um, when, when Kwame called me and said that, that he wanted to uh, uh, honor me with this award and I was uh, able to, to come here tonight, I, I really felt that these kinds of gatherings are not about celebration of an individual or individual achievements or accomplishments, but really an opportunity to celebrate our community and for us to come together uh, and celebrate ourselves and our struggle and our progress. As I entered this room and saw and connected with a number of old friends of mine, some that I hadn't seen in some time, Mary Kay Boyd, a good old friend of mine, Archie Givens, I saw uh, over there, a good old a friend of mine as well. That, was, that is really what this evening is about. It isn't about necessarily individual honors or achievement, but the opportunity for us to come together to recognize each other, to recognize our, our history, to recognize our community, uh, and to support one another. And this award really reflects that for me. Uh, this award is also particularly meaningful to me because it reflects one of the principles of Kwanzaa, which is self-determination. And I think of all the principles, this is one that is perhaps most near and dear to me and most important to me. Uh, our community will not rise up, will not progress, uh, unless we really look to ourselves to do that. And this award really reflects that and embodies that. And that's a principle that is near and dear to my heart. So I want to thank you all for this. I am deeply, deeply appreciative uh, of this and appreciate the opportunity to share the evening with you. Thank you so much. Hotep, everyone. Hotep. And I am to 
bestow the award upon my sister friend, whom I'm going to ask to come and stand with me, Van Owens Hayes, because we have always, as we were raised in the Rondo community, we have always done things together. <laughs> so, so, and we're at the age now, if one of us forgets a word, then the other one will fill it in. And some days we have to say, and so who has the memory today? But I would like to, first of all, acknowledge her family, her husband, Mr. Ward Bell, and the third of her children, Derek, Darren, and two of her grandchildren, and they're right here, Darren Hayes, and his daughters. <laughs> well, Van was born and raised in the Rondo community, and her she was the fourth of, youngest of four children. Her mother was a teacher, her father was the director of the Urban League. And I want you to know that her mother was the only black teacher I ever had in my whole K-12 career in St. Paul. And thank God for her. Well, this is about Van. And Van, having grown up in Rondo, and having lived the life of service, went on to, uh, through her K-12 career, and to the University of Minnesota, graduated from law school. Upon graduation, as she was walking across the stage, it was announced that she would be the dean, assist was it assistant dean? Assistant. assistant dean of students. And she went from that to the uh, relations, uh, dean of external relations. <laughs> She's had these um, more than one word <laughs> positions. <laughs> Help me with the memory, Van. And then she became the director of the Civil Rights Department in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, she's supposed to be like me, retired. But um, <laughs> she is now serving as a consultant, cultural consultant, to the St. Paul, city of St. Paul and Ramsey County Health Department. And among her many awards and recognitions, she has been awarded the, uh, she's in the, the Hall of Fame for the St. Paul Central Hall of Fame. And there are many, but this is, yes, indeed, St. Paul Central. How many Centralites are here? <laughs> Onward Central. <laughs> but, but as, um, <laughs> and she's also, she, she's also a member of, I don't know if many of you have read the Voices of Rondo about the Three Fours Club. And also the, uh, she's a sister of Soro and AKA, all service organizations. So in the spirit in which we were raised, she gives of herself and her time in service. And for that, she's being recognized for the NIA, which is purpose, to make our collective vocation the building and development of our community in order to restore our people to our traditional greatness. This is the way we were raised. This is what it's all about. And she, Dr. Van Owens Hayes, personifies that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Most of my work has been done behind the scenes. I'm not used to uh, being up front or uh, getting awards. But I do want to say uh, a couple of things. One, I'm very proud to receive it, uh, especially since two of the other recipients uh, are peers of my son Christian, and I can't wait to share with him that his very good friends, uh, Mark Robinson and Ralph Crowder, um, have stayed here and, and made us proud as, as proud as we thought we would be of them. And so that is particularly valuable to me. I'm glad my family is here. Um, the most precious thing besides having children is having grandchildren. And uh, they're A students and basketball players and doing very well. So um, I have high hopes for them as we all do. And it's been a village for me. For those of you who have known me since I was a kid, and that's not too many in this room, um, <laughs> my parents died when I was very young. I had lost them both by the time I was 14. Um, and yet I was able to 
go on to college and go on to law school and have a full, a very full and blessed life. And that's because of the village of support and love that came through the church and the social organizations in this community. So I feel very indebted to the Rondo community because no one will ever understand, except those of us who grew up in it, what a precious wealth of knowledge and culture it was. And it may never return to that. It may always be in our head, but I really want to impart that to the kids that are growing up there now, that you have a wonderful heritage, uh, and the village is still here. Thank you. Hotep. Uh, <laughs> First of all, let me say that as I look out and see all those beautiful faces out there, um, I'm very humbled that, uh, to even be up here. And I'm glad that in about two seconds, in fact, uh, Tanya's come on up here. <laughs> so, so I don't have to be up here by myself. And, uh, <laughs> And speaking of that, um, I got to have somebody else come up here with me, uh, Kwame. Mm -hmm. And um, first of all, I, I have to say this before I get to this young lady. Uh, uh, when I when I look out here and I think that um, you know I see my, I guess uh, if you want to say wise elders. Uh, you know, people around me who came before me, because I know that I wouldn't be here standing here if it wasn't for them. And, and you know, my mentors along the way, which are a lot of people in the room, which they, whether they knew it or not, you know, and um, from Mott to Bobby and, and Kwame, and, uh, you know, they just allowed me and, uh, you know, my brother and my family to, uh, you know, flourish. And when I see, uh, you know, Mr. Carter sitting there and things, and, a lot of times people did things that they didn't even know that they did. You know, they weren't trying to be role models or anything, but they were. Or think about, you know, Mary Kay Boyd, and I think about Mary McDonald, and I think about they were pioneers along with my Aunt Wilma. You know, they were all together coming up, and um, so it just makes me proud to be, you know, up here. And um, like I said, sometimes people did things that they didn't know they did such as this uh, young lady standing next to me, and she didn't necessarily know she was being a, a role model to a lot of people, to especially a lot of the young ladies. Now, she wrote down a couple things on this little piece of paper right here, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't really very much, you know, but that's why I had me up here to help fill in. And, and Roger, as you know, as you talk about get older, then you'd be pulling out them cheaters to be looking. <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, okay. It says, <laughs> it says hometown, Memphis, Tennessee. She's been a Twin Cities resident for 30 years. I'm going to save that best to last for me there. She's been in Minneapolis physical education, educated for at least 20 years. Went to the University of, she has a University of Minnesota bachelor's degree of science. Went to St. Mary's University, got her master's. She's uh, spent some time coaching uh, girls varsity basketball over north. And she was one of the uh, pioneers in, you know, we have the NBA, now we have the WNBA. But before there was the WNBA, there was some pro women's teams and leagues. And, uh, you know, there was the Minnesota Phillies. So some of you are too young to remember that. But Tanyas was out there before some of the, you know, some of the young ladies you hear about now that were supposedly big and bad and could play and things. But Tanya's was doing it before, before they were doing it. She was doing it, you know. And um, so, the, the Kwame, you know, the last part I saved on here, you know, the most important thing she did was, you know, she played for the Summer University Stars, man. You know, and um, people like, you know, there's Val, little's, little's back there who played for the Stars. and. We can name all kinds of the community sisters, and, and, and Kwame, I'm going to have him say a little bit of something because we are the most proud of, of all the things she did. You know, of all the things she did, we are quite proud of that because there were a lot of the young ladies, a lot of the girls 
And even the guys who looked up, the boys that were coming up, who looked up to her because she could get on the court and she could whoop all of them too. <laughs> That's how good she was. But again, not only as a basketball player, but as a person and as a human being because as we know in our community, sports and education do go together and can go together and we can get some good mileage out of it if we help our young people do that. And um, so, uh, Kwame, did, am I missing something? Is there something else you would want to say about this young lady? <laughs> Actually, there's so much that I'd want to say. Uh, I'd keep you all here till tomorrow morning. So I'm just not going to start. <laughs> <laughs> Now, y'all know me that if <laughs> Kwame must be trying to keep the program shorter, Mitch, Mitch must have gave him the sign. <laughs> so uh, without saying really too much of anything else, I'd like to present this award to Sister Tanya Chavers. And t Sister, would you say a few words to us? Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you so much. I'm standing between uh, my two coaches that I had for 10 years, and I can honestly say that they're the two best coaches that I've ever had in my life. I have memories that I will always treasure. And like uh, Steve said, I'm originally from Memphis, Tennessee, but I consider the Twin Cities home because I've been here longer than I lived in Memphis. <laughs> and the way that the community has supported me through my education and I'm looking at Mitch, I heard you working on your PhD. I remember when you were a freshman, your dad tricked me into going to Wilberforce, Ohio, and told me to leave my car here, but we won't get into that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> congratulations, and I am, I am really humbled by this. I'm so glad that you stopped when you did, because otherwise, you know I'm a crybaby, so I'm going to get through this. But I really do uh, appreciate this award. I'm very humbled by it. and. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hotep. Hotep. Oh man, this this has been wonderful. Uh, I just want to uh, stand. I'm. Uh, a proud recipient of this award. But when Kwame asked me this time to present this award to this lady, come on up, Naida, because this was like payback. When I came to St. Paul, I didn't have any family. Uh, I came here, well, I had a cousin who I ended up donating a kidney to. But I was working at Health Partners, and I met this lady that, just lit a fire under everything I ever believed in. Naida was, I know she's got a few children, the twins, Dennis and Damone and Andrea, <laughs> but she immediately became my mama. <laughs> Naida would go to this guy, his name was George Halverson. He was the CEO of Health Partners. And Naida would refuse to let him just say what he wanted to say. Naida made Health Partners the most diverse place I've ever had the pleasure of working. Naida stayed in their face. Naida instituted what we called the African American uh, little panel advisory. We'd get to drive out to Bloomington and get paid to go to a meeting. I thought that was just wonderful because it took. <laughs> but Naida has always been the person who was out front when she took over at uh, Aurora St. Anthony, I knew that it was gonna flourish and it has. Under her leadership, uh, Aurora St. Anthony has taken a word called collaboration and taken neighbors and made neighbors collaborate with each other. I am so proud to call Naida a friend, a mother, and they're laughing because this is mom. I, I can't call her Naida. <laughs> She's really helped me 
and the Daryl that became Reverend Spence is because of people like Naida. I stand on her shoulders. I love her. We support you. And thank you so much for being so involved in your community, your home. And thank you for welcoming a stranger like me. So today I, with pleasure, give you the, uh-oh, I didn't broke it. Ooh. Don't worry, Bobby can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> you jamma. Co cooperative economics to build and maintain our stores, ships, and other businesses to profit them together. Naida Presley is a leader of significance in economic, business, and entrepreneurial renaissance in the Frogtown community and throughout St. Paul. Thank you. The award was for collective economics. That's very, very important in our community. I want to know how many people are in here own their own business. Raise your hand. How many of you in here buy from each other, your other black business, when you need something? That's what I'm talking about. We have to have collective economics. When we were growing up, when I was growing up, my parents said get a edu good education, get a good job, but they never said own your own business. So now we're teaching our young people, get a good education, yes, get a good job, but make sure you're handing out the jobs so you own your own business. As a community developer, nonprofit developer, I stand at a door. And we do community econ economics, helping people start their own business. I partner with folks that help with lending. We do housing. We do home ownership as a way for folks to create wealth. And as I stand at that door, trust me, I have the opportunity to let folk pass through it. And I promise you, as long as I'm here and I'm doing this, I'm gonna make sure my people get work, they get opportunities, and they're going to make some money. <laughs> One of the projects we just uh, finished doing in partnership with four nonprofits in the Frogtown Rondo. I don't know why everybody wants to call it Frogtown. Where is Rondo? Where is some of you? But it's always called Frogtown, and I don't belittle it. But it's Rondo, some of you, and Frogtown. We just finished a project on University and Dale, senior housing and commercial on the bottom floor. Our mission and our value in that project was to make sure that it was black, de by, developed by blacks, and owned and operated as well by African Americans. All the businesses in that corner are all either African or African-American owned. You can't see me yet. So I'm going to end by saying we've got to create our economic base. With the destruction of Rondo, we lost that economic base. And no, we're not going to recreate it, but guess what? We can create some new economics together. And I'm going to end by saying Harambe. And what does that mean? Let's all pull together. What's going on, everybody? Hotep. That's what everybody's saying, right? Um, my name is Derek Rubin. It's my daughter, Anaya. It's my son, Ariane. My other son, Orion. They're triplets. And um, I just came here today. Um, Kwame had enlightened me on some uh, uh, something that you know something was going on tonight, and he he asked me if I wanted to present um, an award to a good friend of mine. And I thought about it, and I said, absolutely, I do that. Um, I've known this this uh, young brother for thirty short years. <laughs> thirty short years, and. Um, his mom was like a mom to me, and his dad was like a father to me, and uh, he's definitely like a brother to me. 
And um, I just wanted to share for a couple of minutes through my eyes um, some things that he's, he's accomplished and the impact that he's made in this community. Um, graduated from North High School. North High School. Um, North High. Um, went to Hampton University, Black College. Virginia Union, sorry, Black College. Um, he was the founder of a GBA, Ghetto Basketball Association, um, co-founder of the Inner City All-Star Classic, um, which is a all-star game created for graduating seniors, male and female, giving them the opportunity to be, to uh, have exposure that have been, you know, overlooked um, throughout their high school career. It's an all-black thing. Um, it's been very instrumental in uh, supporting the youth and giving back to the youth. Uh, he's done hip-hop summits. Um, panel discussions uh, about community issues. Um, he's done documentaries on homeless people out east, uh, out west, Los Angeles. Um, very touching and it's real, uh, some real deep footage. Uh, um, he's also uh, did a, another uh, spinoff of uh, Ghetto Basketball Association called GBA, which is Ghetto Barber Shop, Ghetto Barber Association. And uh, he's really reached out to the youth. Uh, for those that don't know, um, he's continuing to do that. He definitely speaks his mind, um, goes against the grain a lot, you know what I mean? But a very creative and a very, very uh, brilliant person. And uh, somebody that you're going to hear a lot about, you know, from time, from years to come. And um, I want to present this award that my daughter has right here uh, for purpose. Ralph, I want you to come up here. This is, what is it, the purpose one? Yeah. Oh, okay. What's happening, St. Paul? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, um, first of all, I just want to give St. Paul a big round of applause for showing leadership, because we need some of this in Minneapolis. Um, you know, St. Paul's always been like the, the next village across the water, a little smaller community, but I mean, St. Paul, y'all definitely, you guys are tight with it as far as black community affairs. Um, and I've always looked at St. Paul as being um, pioneering and, and showing leadership um, in the local conversation. So um, uh, I'm thankful to be here. Um, it's good to, to get an award from my people, Brother Kwame. I appreciate that, brother, because I've been getting a lot of heat from my people, man. <laughs> <laughs> man. God, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> I thought my people was going to arrest me for something for a little while. I, I didn't understand it. Um, man, but uh, it's good to also have purpose and, and Nia in your life. And, uh, you know, Kwanzaa's came a, a long way. You know, I remember there's a, there's a few of us in here that used to celebrate this in basements uh, when we were real little. And we was all extended family as we still are right now. And uh, these principles were definitely um, ingrained in us, not just to speak them, but to live them. So, I mean, just to be operating in purpose is a beautiful thing. And um, I just got back, actually, from seeing my father. Uh, actually, I just got back from Memphis and Los Angeles. And uh, my dad actually had a... <laughs> Yeah, my dad, he actually had a stroke, right? So I went out there to check on him. He's doing better. But in the process of seeing my father, I was able to actually go through some archives that he had. Um, a lot of old audio tapes, a lot of old 8 millimeter footage kind of stuff. And I was able to actually listen to the conversations that was going on in the community back in the early 70s. And a lot of you that are old enough that were you know, of age during that time were on those audio tapes and many of you were actually saying the same thing that we're talking about now. Now, the interesting thing is, is that some of you 
look the other way while the youth are talking about it, the people who came after you. And some of you kind of looked in the other direction like you're a little uncomfortable with, with the way we're speaking now, but I mean, we're, we're the seeds of, of, you, of you. So, I mean, you know, when you hear us start talking like that, you need to start embracing that, you know, and, and not look the other way because I can see how the children right now are feeling about my generation. You know what I mean? I mean, they're looking at us like, man, what are you guys doing? You know, we're out here telling you how it really is, and you, and you Negroes are looking the other way with a lot of education. You understand? So um, I'm thankful that my brother Derek is right here. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad my son is back there videotaping, and my daughter's back there, and Mari's back there, and Monique's back there. You can't do nothing without uh, family and support behind you, um, and you definitely can't do nothing without God behind you. Yeah. And um, I'm thankful just for the community and just to be here in fellowship with you guys, and um, I appreciate the award. And thank you, Brother Kwame. Hotep, Hotep, Hotep. Hola. Hi, Barigani. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Bonjour, comment allez-vous? What I'm trying to say is that <coughs> we're not only a world people, not only an African people, we are a world people. We belong to all of those speech communities. And in each of those speech communities, we've changed the language in every one of them, African people. So we're world people. I have the um, daunting task of talking about somebody who's not here. <laughs> I don't think he needs to be here because he's not only a public figure in our community, he, his name is renowned. He's a worldwide figure in culture, in music, in history, in art. And you all know I'm talking about <laughs> Gary Hines whom I've known <laughs> most of his life. He came in with his mother. The world's a funny place. From Yonkers, New York, when he was still a schoolboy. I'm talking about Doris Hines. I used to read about in the black press. I can see her now, her image standing in front of a piano or something, same with Duke Ellington and so forth, who still gives the greatest rendition I've ever heard of Satin Doll. Yeah. And I've heard Sarah, my girl, <laughs> tell that I think she outdoes Sarah, Sarah Vaughn. Um, so I've known Gary, and, it's a, and I'm not going to try to do what you did, but it's hard. So I brought something to surprise him with. Um, I've known Gary since he was a uh, when I was the education director of the Way Community Center. How many people heard of the Way? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, we tried to do it. We tried to do what, what he was talking about. Straight up, in your face, blackness. <laughs> Culturally, historically, you know, politically, we're black. That's before James Brown said black and I'm proud. Got in a lot of trouble for it. Uh, we embraced the Black Panthers, Th yes, because we think they were warriors. <laughs> they were part of an oppressed nationality. We are we are oppressed nationality, y'all. I'm sorry. I know it doesn't look like that sometimes, but it is. <laughs> if you can't define your identity and destiny, you're not free. <laughs> I don't care who you are. <laughs> I don't care what color you are. Anyway, Gary kind of grew up around me. He was in the classes at the way. And I knew him first as a student, as a scholar, and a good athlete. <laughs> and um, he was once 
the bodybuilding champion of Minnesota, yeah. and so forth. Uh, when he got out of high school, we, re we reunited at McAllister College. Uh, he took classes with me, straight A's, uh, played on the varsity football team and did everything well. He's a very responsible human being. Uh, Doris Hine did a great job with all of her children, but she's, she is it. She, he is it. So Gary and I were at McAllister when we, he, this notion of having a black choir uh, came about that would preserve black people's peoplehood in music. This is an important institution who's, who's really educating the world about black music. They've been everywhere, Brazil. Gary's been teaching in Japan black music for 20 years, back and forth. We've got a black culture in Japan. <laughs> People who singe their hair so you can look like yours. It was a genuine, a feeble effort on my part to attempt to wake the town and tell the people that the sounds of blackness are a unique reflection of a positive image in the world, an image so desperately needed at this time, <laughs> that time and this time. They are acknowledged that they are an African people. They claim spirituals, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, gospel, jazz, and blues, and I want to reiterate, yes, rock and roll. <laughs> it's a black idiom. They are all ours, and they are all on this album. And we love you. I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, the sounds of blackness. Gary is certainly. She's not here. Mahmoud has already shared this word, Habari Ghani. See, because when we were, that's right, what's the word? Because see, when we were kids, Ralph, you broke it down. When we were babies, there was two things we had to have in our spirits and our hearts. It was the principles of Kwanzaa and Guza Saba. So I say Habari Ghani and lift up Moja. Yes. Kuji Chakalia, we had to say it right. And we get pop. <laughs> Ujima, Ujama, Nia, Kuamba, Imani, Nia. And so those are all the words. That's the spirit in this house tonight. We also had to have in our hearts and never look at paper the Black National Anthem <laughs> beyond the first dance. <laughs> and then we were little kids and we used to throw that fist up, remember? So it kind of bothers me today when I see uh, young choirs singing it and they got to look on the paper and still can't get it right. See, our community, our village was very deliberate about us walking in those, of those ways that would ensure our destiny. I want to thank Kwame for bestowing the Kwanzaa Wise Owl Award upon me some years back. And I just have to take a moment because all of you recipients, as you look out, and Brother Bill, you shared it, to look out and see the people but I am reminded of the beautiful faces I saw when I received mine. And her spirit is with us, Mary McDonald, because I teared up when I saw Mary, and um, Katie McGuire. So I'm proud to be, to be here tonight. And in the spirit of Kwanzaa, for, Kwame, for you to ask me to, um, to lift up, and if you would come up, if you could roll on over here. Sister Elder Kim White. I ain't getting it to you yet. I got a few more things to say because um, she has served. She's a servant leader for many, many years with Ramsey County, making sure our babies were protected and cared for. And also her and her Wonderful husband for all, most almost my life. I got to see you two as visions of possibilities for me. So I'm still holding out till I 
to something like y'all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but also, in the spirit of Kwanzaa, has um, with the, 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 the shepherding and the, the, the guidance of Reverend Dr. Earl Miller and the progressive church family, has presented a gift to the village in the form of the African-American calendar honoring the queens and the kings of the village. And um, when she called me um, last year to say that um, I was going to be included, because, see, often, and, and, and to, again, for me, thank you, Kwame, for picking me to, to be able to bestow the Imani Faith Award upon, um, come on, stand by me. Because <laughs> um, the Bible says the prophet is without honor in his own homeland. But when we have the Kwanzaa Awards, and that we are a, when we're able to be a part of the powerful calendar for which people, teachers, school administrators, community agency leaders put the, those pictures on the walls. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times, every, so many places I've seen Elder Mary Kay Boyd's picture on somebody's wall. Amen. But when we think about, <laughs> everybody, oh, and, and, many, and many others through the years, our children get to see visions of possibilities. That's right. So I was just so, so honored to be a servant, not a prophet, in her home, own homeland being honored. The night was incredible. I still get chills. It was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful event. And so um, it's, it is my honor to um, present to you. This time I get to do it to you. Yeah. And you know what? At the ceremony, only she, <laughs> other than the Hit Clan uh, aunties, called me baby girl. She just called me out that night, baby girl, you can do that. Thank you. Imani, keep the faith. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, wow. Good evening, everyone. Oh, no, no, no. What? What's my word? Hotel. Hotel. Bobby's still teaching me. Hotel. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for this beautiful award, and you know this touches my heart because you know my first love other than my God is my people. And ever since I arrived, this city adopted me and my family um, to Stafford years ago. I came to St. Paul and, and I was given an elder, and that was your mom. And um, she said, she, took me by my side. She said, mm, you got possibilities. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing coming to this beautiful city and watching the tree lines and w or watching the culture of the black community. And, and I thank goodness for my brother Al for setting, selling here and making a home base for us to come to, to share what the gifts that God has given us to this community, which we truly love because we have not left. And looking around the city and all these places that have touched my life and shaped my life and, and knowing that David touched my life and an opportunity to share that with our children, to share that with our children because working in the school system, working with the, in the government, seeing our kids overrepresented in one system and underrepresented in another system, you know, they don't know about the possibilities. And so it was an opportunity for us, but along with our pastor and, and our team at Progressive City, let's tell the stories of our people. Let's record it because if we don't record it, no one else will. And so we began this five years ago to tell the story and put it in schools and put it everywhere so kids will have a, 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 a a foundation to build upon because we want this to go on and on and on. Kwame and I was talking a couple of two weeks ago when he called me, he scared me because he knows I don't like this. I like to be behind the scenes. To we were talking about how many people we have on list of African Americans in the twins in the state of Minnesota. It's amazing. And we need to know who we are. 
We need to know who's in the business sector. We need to know who's in the health sector. We need to know in the education sector. We need to know all where we are and what we're about. And our children needs to know that also. So with that, with the love of my God, the love of my people who I truly have faith in, every day we rise because we still here. <laughs> and with the love of my family and the love of my husband, <laughs> who, is, who is my rock, I, I thank you. I only thank you, Kwame, for think of a little sister like me. You know, I got a lot of growing yet to go. But you had faith in me to give me a shout, so it thank you. It was wise how I did that. I love that all. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, and I will go back and share it with uh, my family at Progressive because without them, I would not have been able to do this. And look for next year. We'll be back next year, and many of you in the room, will, hey, you never know. Nice seeing you, sister. Okay. Hey, thank you. Good evening. Again, this is just too good to be true. Uh, and introducing to some people, I think most of you know him or know the name of the Gibbons family. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to do this because too often people from this walk of life get lost who do a lot of things that are invisible. You know, I know his, his family reasonably well. Unfortunately, I never knew Mr. Givens well, uh, the father of Archie. But I think what Archie represents, he's almost a Renaissance man, <laughs> you know, as a guy who's a successful business person with a humanitarian heart <laughs> and the c commitment of a true educator. <laughs> he has um, founded a critical institution in our community. And I'll just say this and no more. There are too many things to say about this man. But outside of the Schomburg in New York, which is the greatest collection of books of black people in the world, there's no library in Africa <laughs> has more titles than the Schomburg Connect, uh, uh, um, Library in uh, Harlem, New York. This is, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the black colleges, but private collections, <laughs> is the largest collection in the black community in any city. Um, as part of that, Gary was a part of the Hutner collection that was a original collection of the, a Euro-American man with a lot of black books. <laughs> He's trying to get rid of them. Uh, and fortunately enough, the Given family brought, bought the books and established this great library, uh, uh, the Given's book collection. Um, sponsors lectures. He's he is an educator, and an educator to me is you use any method possible to lead people out of ignorance. It doesn't matter how you do it, <laughs> whether you're standing on your head or your feet. And he does that, and I'm sure will continue to do that. In addition to being responsible for many of our uh, the buildings around this city, you know, apartment complexes and so forth, is done by his firm. So I can't say enough about you. Uh, you know, I appreciate you, uh, you know, and, and people like you, because all too often, let's be honest, <laughs> I mean, the business community, the black community is somewhere over there. <laughs> we don't see the community, the, the connection, particularly in a town like this, because this is not Atlanta, this is not Chicago, this is not Wall Street and Tulsa, you know you know, where businesses were very evident and some of the most celebrated people in those communities are business people. <laughs> They've kind of gotten lost in the shuffle after, after uh, integration. So I can't tell you how, how pleased I am to be able to present to Archie Givens, Jr., the Imani Award, which means faith. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I am so honored and so touched and so moved to be the recipient of this award. Uh, when Kwame first called me and said, Archie, can you come over? Uh, he did the same thing to me, now, you know, wherever you are. In February 23rd. I said, well, maybe. I don't know, but okay. What time? Well, I'll call you back. <laughs> and then he called and said, how about the 28th? <laughs> and I said, what time? He said, I'll call you back. <laughs> Anyways, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank you, Mahmoud, for those very, very, very kind words. I'm one of those Minneapolis interlopers to uh, all you St. Paulites. Uh, grew up in Minneapolis and uh, would come across the Lake Street Bridge as often as we could. Uh, there were some very attractive women over here in those days. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we, uh, <laughs> we kept going back and forth as, as young guys growing up. And, and I found my, the mother of my daughters, Jeannie Collins, over here. And, uh, and uh, very, 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 very happy to share this whole Rondo community uh, in that process. So uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's very special to me to be over here again. Uh, I do do work in this part of town over here, and the Rondo Library is one of my cherished properties, and Aida and I were partners in doing that, and, and, uh, and so we wanted to keep Rondo alive, keep the spirit alive, keep the hope alive, and uh, where else to keep history but in a library. And uh, I looked up on the board, and I saw uh, <coughs> what's literacy, and, and I was reading what is taught here to the young people about reading, about writing about the importance of, of, of literature in our world. And, and it tells me, everybody talks about the gap, the reading gap, graduation gap, all the gaps, but we'll never close them until we learn those principles, reading, writing, and speaking. And what a better way, to, I feel, to help our young people learn about their history, but also to get engaged with reading, other than reading about our own selves and people like us, people that look like us and talk like us. And, and so that's what we're all about. And the Tondo goes to the classrooms around Twin Cities and works on our behalf and teaches kids how to use uh, African American literature, teaches educators, teachers how to use African American literature. And yeah. so uh, the other thing that I've got a couple of board members, Barbara and Al over here from our Givens Foundation board. So we try and keep all, all everybody involved, and I want to thank them for being here today, too. Uh, uh, I love what I do. I'm blessed to do what I do, and, and, I, and I can't thank you enough for this honor and this award. So, thank you. Okay, um, why is all asked me to uh, do this one? Uh, and the first people I want, this is for families who have collectively worked for the uplift, advancement, and progress of the community. Uh, the first uh, family I'd like to uh, introduce is Wuzumuzi and Natando Zulu. Um, I have, ever since I've been in and out of Minnesota, which is three times, <laughs> always looked forward to when I could be with these two people. They not only work in the community, work on committees, work in the neighborhood, but they also teach us. A lot of people think that they are being entertained by these two people, but when it's over, they have, in fact, <coughs> been taught. And I'm not going to uh, stand here and tell you all that I think about them, which is all positive, because we would be here a long, long time. We've already been here a long time, and uh, I just want to thank uh, you all for being patient. And I also want to give uh, both of you a chance to say hello. In your own way, in your own way. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, um, we, um, we are storytellers, but we do say that uh, Mahmoud is the griot, mm -hmm. because the griot is the one who has the history, tells the history that we need to know. So and being storytellers, we have, um, we also incorporate some of our history going with uh, 
people that make a difference to us. I mean, I, I like to tell children, I get to do a job that I love, and I even get paid for it sometimes, you know, and not everybody gets, and not everybody gets to do that. You know what I'm saying? And I do love sharing stories with children. That's where we were today uh, in uh, Cedar Falls, Iowa. No, Cedar Falls. Cedar Falls. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, in Cedar Falls, Iowa, you know, he did all of the driving. I thank him for that because I, I certainly didn't feel like doing the driving. But anyway, we were trying to push and make sure we got back here, you know, on time. And then we threw a little water up in the air and ran up under it and changed our clothes and came on over here. All right. So anyway, we want to thank you for this award. We really appreciate it. I definitely want to say thank you as well to each one of you. It, it really is a, an honor and a privilege to be amongst the other honorees and all of you because you are extremely important to us. Now, Mahmoud is the reason why I'm, I'm even in Minnesota in the first place. If it had not been for Mahmoud, I would never have stayed in Minnesota. Now, my mother was born in St. Paul. My uncle was born in St. Paul, okay? But it was only after the death of my uncle that I came back and going trying to go out with somebody else, not no time no this time, this is long, long before her, <coughs> <laughs> trying to go out with somebody else who told me that they were going to a class, and of course I was at that point in time, you know how you get to begging, I mean, the sisters don't know, but the brothers do. You know how you kind of beg, well, you know, look, I'm only going to be here for a little while, why not me tonight, you understand, that kind of thing, and I didn't make it because she said, you know, I'm going to be at this class, and I said, well, okay, what about after the class? So I wound up going to the class and forgot all about the girl because I heard Mahmoud el Kati talk to me about history and tell me about Africa, where I had been, and it was just like the other brother said when he said that you know a tree be a tree, but it don't know it be a tree. So just because I had been there didn't mean I understood a thing about it. So when Mahmoud started talking about it in a way that made sense, like, Lions don't live in the jungle. <laughs> Tarzan does not live in Africa. And I'm talking about, well, where do they live and where in the world does he live then? You understand? <laughs> now, I'm a grown man. But I did not know that. I had no understanding of the fact that Africa is four and a half times larger than the continental United States. That you can put the entire United States into the Sahara Desert, go all the way around it and never touch it. I had no knowledge of that at that time. And had it not been for Mahmoud, I probably still would not have known. But then he taught me. And I learned. And he gave me that first little old children's colored book, coloring book on African American history, which got me started. Now, what we have been doing for the past 19 years, this will be the 20th year that we've had Signifying and Testifying, which is a black master storytelling festival. And like Brother Kwame says, it's not about just entertainment. It's called edutainment. We do it the way that Richard Pryor used to do it. It's where you would learn something when you didn't know you were learning something. And that's what we try to deal with. So this year we'll have our 20th year. And we're going to let y'all know that there are four things that we're going to be dealing with this year. One of them will be when you get a chance to see Notando in a different light. Instead of just being that master storyteller, as she's going to do, a thing called Ain't Dicey channels Mom's Mabley. Now, most of y'all are a little too young to remember Mom's Mabley. But she's going to do a Mom's Mabley thing with the Fringe Festival. That's going to be this year. Then we're going to do the Black Storytellers with the Fringe Festival. Now, some of you already know the Fringe Festival. We have no idea where we're going to be. But we're going to be somewhere. So we have to make sure that y'all know about that. That's one thing that we're going to do. Then we're going to do another one where we do a... A, a, a bottling fashion show where we're going to use clothing and items brought from us. Reuse sometimes from us. Okay? To show how we have been able to make something out of nothing on an ongoing basis. And then after that, we're also going to do our third thing. We're going to deal with having our 20th Black Storytelling Festival, in which we're going to bring folks from all across the country again to do master storytelling here in the Twin Cities. 
And the fourth thing, and the final thing I'm going to say, because like you say, we have been, y'all have been here a lot longer than we have. And y'all been here a long time. And storytellers can talk a lot. But <laughs> at the same time, or that final thing that, that we are going to deal with doing is to try to make sure that we take some young black folks from here to the National Association of Black Storytelling Festival that will be in Atlanta, Georgia this year. Last year, they were in Minnesota. They were right over here in Minnesota, and we brought black folks from across, the, from across the whole North and South America who came here. And they used to think that Minnesota, y'all ain't got no black folks up there. It's three degrees north of the Arctic Circle is what they think. But they came. Thank you so very much. Okay, this person... Um, I have worked with for a long, long time, and um, I honor him and his family. He is well known throughout the sports world. I don't just mean uh, the Twin City world, I mean the world sports world. And it gives me an honor to have this privilege to introduce a young man who has done so much and given so much to our community. I'm going to let him tell you more about what he's done and how he feels about doing it. Larry Fitzgerald. Hotel. <laughs> how are you? It's a treat to be here, and thank you very much, Kwame. And uh, I see so many familiar faces here tonight. And uh, you know, I got to tell you a quick story. You know, although Kwame and I came together, uh, you know, at the newspaper, uh, when I first set roots in the Twin Cities, my first job was in St. Paul, over at the the old uh, Gould Battery Plant, uh, over on uh, Como. And so uh, I had just gotten kicked out of the NFL with the New York Giants and uh, went back home to Chicago and I, I looked at the faces of my mom and dad and I could kind of see I had let everybody down and uh, but uh, you can't uh, let that hold you down so I remember when I was in high school I had the chance to come to Minnesota uh, for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes uh, camp and we had a, a, a training week here and I only got to go because I was an All-American football player. And I, I got to be exposed to the Twin City area as a child. And I, s I kept some notes and said, hey, this would be a great place to live one day. And uh, fortunately, I was able to do that. And I uh, have been here since uh, uh, 1978. And uh, of course, uh, started as a volunteer over at KMLJ Radio. And I hooked up with the spokesman recorder. And that's where Kwame and I got together. And I feel like uh, Kwame and Charles and, and Mitch and I have uh, put together a pretty strong sports page for the uh, spokesman recorder. You know, we try to compete with, uh, you know, the dailies, you know, Pioneer Press and the Star Tribune. Uh, we only come out once a week. But, of course, we're uh, on the World Wide Web now. And, and that's been very uh, helpful to us. Uh, as many of you know, I've uh, been a part of KMOJ for a long, long time, and uh, just seeing Vusi uh, up here, congratulations on, on your award. And I remember when you were station manager over at KMOJ, and, and you were getting on me all the time about, uh, you know, talking too much on sports, but uh, <laughs> I've been told, that's one thing I've learned about sports in our community. Uh, we, we all want to go to the party, but we don't want to hear about it too much, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, fortunately, that's something I've been into all my, my life. You know, I graduated from Indiana State University in Terre Haute, Indiana, and um, got my education in radio, television, communications. And uh, Wendell Smith, a sports writer, and he used to work on WGN television back in Chicago, was kind of someone who grabbed my attention, seeing that black face on television and in the newspaper, and they said to me, I could do that. And uh, so I kind of tried to follow in his footsteps. And, uh, and here we are today. As you know, uh, 
uh, my wife and I, Carol, who uh, died seven years ago of breast cancer, she did a lot of tremendous things in this community. Uh, we were married in Chicago. Although I had lived here, I went back to Chicago to get her. And uh, we moved here and started our family. And, and now Larry and Marcus have uh, set roots and have done some uh, tremendous things. Of course, Larry's now seven years in the National Football League five times a pro bowler, and uh, within about 30 seconds of being a Super Bowl champion. But uh, I'm really proud of what uh, we've tried to do. Uh, we started the Carol Fitzgerald Memorial Fund uh, seven years ago to uh, try to deal with some of the things uh, in urban education, uh, breast cancer, and HIV, and fighting those battles with the organizations that are out there taking on those challenges. And now seven years into it, we're proud to say we've given away over $500,000 to organizations in our community. This village is awesome. There's so much richness in this village, in an impoverished society. We are so richly blessed from this culture. Uh, I know there's so many people in here that have known me before I knew myself. I didn't know my family. I was born and raised right here in St. Paul. And I crossed over to the waters too sometime. They, you know, it was fun go back and forth. But it's all good. It's all good because, oh, God is so awesome. It's just amazing to look out to see so many beautiful faces. These, uh, Kwame, thank you, Kwame, for asking me uh, to do this. Uh, it is actually such a special award for Mary McDonald was one of my favorite mentors. And it's because of people like her. When I was younger and I worked at Inner City Youth League, and I was tutoring, and she was teaching me how to tutor and teach me how to work with young people. And today, I do the same thing. I work with young people as an educator. And as an educator, I learned educating and working with people is not about you. It's about helping somebody else and pulling them along the way. So it is my privilege and my responsibility to do that and pass that on. Now, the person that I will introduce actually worked in the school as one of my social worker. That is amazing. She was my social worker. She's also my cousin. A lot of y'all don't know she's my cousin. And I did not know this was the person I was going to introduce till I got here. And I've been seeing her all year. Hey, she calls me Smooch. Don't go back. Don't ask me why she called me that, because that's way back in the day. She's the only person in this world that can get away with calling me Smooch to this day. But anyway, Teresa. Teresa is just phenomenal. I mean, she walks the talk. She's a beautiful person inside and out. She's consistent, and she's a caring person, always has been. Just all of the things that Miss McDonald portrayed and exemplified, Teresa exemplifies. And it's because, she, because of her. I saw her when I was in junior high and in high school. She would probably, yeah, you know, you know what you need to do. You know what you need to do. Get back on track. She was always somebody to talk to. And so she was one of those people that helped pave the way and open up the doors for me to be able to go into education without all of the uh, problems that a lot of people have because I was able to look at somebody doing this. That's what's so wonderful about this village. Not only did they teach us, they showed us what to do. Uh -huh. And they showed us and continue to show us. So I just truly appreciate <coughs> this opportunity, Kwame and everybody else that's in here. Um, of course, I played basketball, but basketball, I had to put that basketball down for a minute and do some other things. And that's what I love about this village because you have so many opportunities if you pay attention and watch and listen. You have to watch and listen. So Teresa, please come on up here and tell them. Um, well, she's right. She's only smooched to me. And she um, makes me realize that I'm old. Um, <laughs> Smooch was in high school, um, but I want to first say thank you to Kwame and to uh, the organization for bestowing this honor upon me. Um, and I'm particularly blessed because it is in honor of a woman whose passion and nurturing of children in this community um, got me to where I'm at. So thank you very, very much. Um, for those of you who don't know, I've been with St. Paul Public Schools for about 33 years. Ooh. And um, I started out as a social worker, and, and I'm now a principal. 
Uh, I'm, a, I'm a high school principal, but I have a, a, a very special job. I oversee actually 14 programs for St. Paul Public Schools right now. And of those 14, four of them are, are correctional school programs. So I'm the principal for Boys Totem Town, Juvenile Detention Center, the Adult Detention Center. We even have a full school program in the Adult Detention Center for our juveniles and transitions for success. I have the best job in St. Paul Public Schools. Um, you may think that oh, these children. And I have the dischildren, the disenfranchised, the discouraged, the dismissed, the dismayed, you know, the, the throwaways, you know. Um, but each and every day that I come to work, I see fire in their eyes. I see them at their very, very best. And regardless of what brought them there, I see their capacity, I see their intelligence, I see what they're capable of doing. And I am just blessed. I am blessed. But I will tell you that we have to have a sense of urgency. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We have to have a sense of urgency for our children, for our young women, and particularly our young men. Um, I come to work at Boys Totem Town, and those hundred young men that greet me, 90% um, of them look like me. Um, and for whatever reason that brought them there, <coughs> the fact of the matter is that they are now in the system. And so we've been known as high school principals to be very long-winded. I'm going to be very short and sweet and to the point. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Invest in a child. All you need to do is invest in a child. And that doesn't mean that you have to go deep into your pockets for any money. What it means is that you give an encouraging word that you live by example, that you hold them accountable, that you understand that these are young people who still have a long ways to go and much to learn, and that the travesty is not making a mistake. The travesty is if you fall down and not get up. And so I ask that each and every day that you get up and you see the sunrise, that you say to yourself, I'm going to make a difference in the life of a child. And the life of a child just may be smiling and saying to them, okay, young man, okay, young woman, I believe in you. And so in the spirit of Mary McDonald, who said that each and every day that she gave to children and to the community, I say to you, thank you very much. I'm blessed. Thank you. And as a role model as uh, Teresa is, we have another role model, this young man. I've known all my life. Our families were like family. We're just like family. And I've always been, you know, looked up to this young man as an older brother. But I'm so proud of David. David TC, as he calls himself. Um, we go way, way back. And just to see this young man be a role model, not for just the people under you, but for every generation. I mean, you give back and you give back full fold. You know, you take, just like Teresa, you take the kids that are dished and you do something with them and find that strength, that inner strength in them, so they, they can turn around and do the same thing. My nephew was one of the first people that graduated from your program, wh whether you know it or not. And if it wasn't for your program, my nephew probably wouldn't have graduated because you gravitated and took that young man and showed him what he could do. And to this day, he is doing wonderful things in his life, and he will never, ever forget that. So I just thank you, David, for opening up your the gifts that you have, the opportunities yes. that you had, and you just came back and said, I'm not going to take this out to the world. I'm going to take it back to my community and just let it blow up the way it blew up. And I'm just so proud of you for doing that. So, TC, come on up here and <laughs> show everybody. Hey, sir. Um, thank you. Uh, Hote, I just want to. Hotel. Hotel, motel, holiday inn. If your girl starts acting up, y'all know the rest. That, that's, that's the hip hop, that's the hip hop in me. But, but, but I just, I, first of all, I really, I just want to thank this whole community and my family, along with my family, for giving me the opportunity to beat the odds the way I have. It's just, it's incredible because there's everybody who's been up here speaking somehow have been interwoven and touched me in, in so many different ways. When I think about uh, Mahmoud el Kata, I remember being eight or nine years old. My mother's like, we're going to church. It's an afternoon session. 
and he's doing a presentation on Africa. That was my first introduction into my past, my ancestry and where I came from was from this man right here. Blew me away. From then on, I went to school and I took pictures. I had African beads on. And they were like, why you got them on? You know what I'm saying? But it, it came from what I was being instilled with as a, as a very young person, being prideful of where I was and where I came from. And that, as I came along, I, I kept doing too much of what I had in my pocket, and I ended up, my family did an intervention. And they came to me, and I ended up, they said, we're going to take him over to uh, see Peter Bell at IMCA. And I ended up, I was, I was having a drug problem, and I, they took me to IMCA, and I sat down with this man right here. And he spit it to me. He told me what the do's and the don'ts and the oohs and the ahs, and, and, I, and I made my way. And I had to, that was the first time. I went to treatment three times, by the way, before I, before I understood it. And that's what it takes. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you can take a drug addict to the best doctor, psychiatrist, lawyer, whatever, with all the credentials, but the only person who could show them the way is somebody who's been that way and done made their way back. And that's what happened to me through IFCA. And from then on, you know, I, I still was growing up. I got pushed around some more. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Carter, Melvin Carter Jr., who was here, he, he, um, he um, came to get me to go to Africa. And I was like, I wasn't trying to go to Africa, let me tell you. I, I said, you know, I, you know, I was making all the excuses of what I had to do. He was like, yeah, okay, man, whatever, just get ready because, you know, we're going to do this trip and you need to go. He came over and poked me in my chest and had a talk with me. And so I ended up on that trip. Um, when, before I even started the school, um, Bobby Hickman was pushing me around. At, at Inner City Youth League, I grew up and, and, and I got OG'd. You know, I was, I was inducted into that. And, and, and he called me up one time to go to the Million Man March. And that's when I just had that twinkling of an ideal about high school for recording arts. He's, he called me up. He said, we're going to the Million Man March and blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't trying to go to that. I was like, you know, I got this to do. I got, you know, so he said, yeah, man, we're going to be at your house and pick you up in the van at such and such a time. Just be ready to go. And so I was there. I made that trip. It was beautiful. When, 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 I, when we went there, we went to our hotel room, and the spirit had us so strong that we said, we can't even stay here in this room tonight. We left and went and camped out on the mall. And we sat, we sat there and talked and, and camped out, and the sun came up, and the, and the men started flowing in like water. And the whole Washington, D.C. just filled up with, with um, black men. And it was just a, it was a historic time. So I told Bobby on the way back, I said, you know, I want to start this school, uh, high school for recording. I saw something about it. He was like, yeah, man, well, you just don't know. You fixing to get your butt kicked. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I wasn't trying to hear what he had to say at the time. He said, but you know what? If you need me, let me know, because I'm going to, you know, if you need some help, I'm going to be there for you. So he's been there for me the whole time. So then I, I'm growing up, I'm growing up, I'm learning more and more. And um, so finally I'm fixing to get ground up in the wheel of bureaucracy. And, 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 and um, as, as Kwame says, the white folks was just coming with that bull. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and they was hating on me for no reason. I couldn't understand it because we was doing what we were supposed to be doing. We, was, we were graduating young African-American men at 70%. You know, if you came to our school and you were having problems, like, like the lady said before, you're getting pushed out, suppressed, done in, and thrown away, we were getting you. And 70% of those kids who were coming to us were graduating. So they came up with some craziness that didn't make any sense. They said that we didn't have a 60% a on-time graduation rate. And on-time graduation meant you graduated when you were 18. Well, but over 60% of the kids that come to the school are already 18 when they get there. So there, there's no way we can ever accomplish that. But, but we're doing what we're supposed to do. We're, we're, we're getting them in, 
and we're working with them and we're doing what I heard somebody in here say, by whatever means necessary to bring them out of ignorance. That's what we're, that's what our job is. And that's what we're steadily doing. So somehow Kwame came to the school to see what was going on. And I was crying on his shoulder and telling him why this don't make sense. He said, Hey, this is what happens. This is the normal thing. You got to go up there and get in the people's face and let them know what time it is. And so I was trying to be, I was like, but this, stuff, this is, that's illogical. You have to do this. You know, we want to say, yeah, okay. He said, well, do what you know. Go ahead. Do them steps first. But you're going to have to eventually get to the point where you're going to have to get in their face and let them know what what's all about. So finally, I, we fought and fought. It was the battle of my life. I couldn't believe the situation I was in. It didn't make sense. It, it went against everything I ever understood. But Kwame told me right away in a few minutes what it was all about. He said, "This they're out to destroy you and what you're doing. And that's just the bottom line. So it ended up being um, um, spiritual. And for whatever reason, we, we made it through that point. And our kids right now are engaged in a national program called 26 Seconds, where we teamed up with um, LeBron James, the NBA, State Farm Insurance, and um, Grad Nation, and America's Promise, which is operated by Colin Powell and his wife. We're going to Washington, D.C. on the 21st, and our kids are going to perform at that uh, summit conference. And then they did two full-page ads in the USA Today. Because every 26 seconds, a young person drops out of high school. That's right. And that's an epidemic. And that's something that um, is me all the way. Without, without the help of this community and my family and all those experiences, which is just a few. Because a lot of y'all, you all know the good and the bad about me. But I've really been able to turn my life around and make something positive out of all what I didn't even understand my higher power was preparing me to do. It just, it, it came to me at the right time in the right place. So it's just all these people in here, all of y'all, I love you. And I appreciate the strength and the wisdom that you've given to me because without this community, I don't know where I would be. And I just, I just, I'm so thankful for the heritage that I'm still discovering to this day. There's more to it than even Mahmoud El Kate knows. Because our father, the most high, he has the real knowledge. But he's using us as his people to 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 bring forward what needs to be done and the and the change is coming. And it's just a matter of time. And so I just hold on and I just present to you another young brother from the hood. Just like me. <laughs> well, while I'll let uh, Wise Owl bid you adieu, um, <clears throat> there was one young lady who was uh, unable to be here this evening uh, who was also an awardee uh, who is busy teaching uh, a class right now as we speak. Um, her name is Valerie Gaither, Dr. Valerie Gaither, whom we uh, lovingly uh, referred to as Thimby. Um, she's uh, what I call, Thimby stands about like this, but she's a quiet giant. She uh, teaches, her heart is into everything that she does when it comes to being about her people. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's an organization called BAD, Buddhist of African descent, and she is a strong uh, coordinator of that whole effort and I won't take the time now to tell you what it's all about, but um, you should know. Um, she is a professor at Metropolitan State uh, University, and, uh, and that's where she is now teaching. But um, <clears throat> she was one of the people that encouraged me to become uh, a student at Metro. Uh, and and uh, I'm what you might call, at my age and all that, enrolling, so I'm what you call a non-traditional student. <laughs> but. Well, you know, <laughs> but what happens is, is that as, as, as Elder Saber back there and Mother Toom always talks about the fact that we cannot <coughs> ever stop uh, gaining and producing knowledge. Amen. And, and, <coughs> and so, uh, yeah, I'm there, but 
Uh, speaking of Valerie, again, uh, that's one of the people that uh, uh, stays on me uh, all the time. Uh, uh, did you get that paper done? Well, I kind of ain't no, well, I kind of, did you get that paper done? And then she doesn't, and, 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 and doesn't. When I say, well, I need a little help, well, I'll show you what the paper should look like, but you're going to have to do the work. And so even though she encourages me, she makes sure that I do my own work, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. But she, all, she encourages people uh, to go ahead and get that good education. Now, she knows also of my love for the theater, and she realizes I don't get a chance to engage in that too much. But we go to plays a lot. She always says, Bobby, you got some tickets to go to play? Okay. And so we go to plays all the time and uh, uh, learn a lot from that. I even enrolled in, a, in I mean, took a course that talks about theater appreciation uh, to go there and kind of uh, see what we can ferret out from that that uh, they don't say in the, uh, in the program. At any rate, uh, last week, in fact, we went to... Um, to uh, the Guthrie to see Penumbra's production of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. If you haven't seen it, <laughs> if you haven't, I, I tell you, I, I, I'll lend you my heart if that would it take for you to go see that. Uh, strong message, strong message, uh, well played uh, by the actors. Abdul uh, El Razak is one of them, uh, and, uh, and then Javita Steele. But uh, you may go there expecting one thing, you'll get a pleasant surprise in terms of what is put out there. And what is happening is, is that, of course, when you go to the theater, the audience are generally, uh, predominantly white. Uh, but if you know the play, and if you haven't seen it, go see it. If you know the play, it speaks directly to them about how ridiculous your notion was the way you thought you should treat us. And then brothers don't hold back at all on that. You might think you're going to see a musical. It's music to your ears, and there's very little singing. Uh, so, so, so go see it. And and what happens is is that uh, um, uh, Valerie again, Thimby, uh, uh, said to uh, uh, give uh, her love to all of you, and that she was going to try to make it after class, but she wasn't going to cut the class short. That's the kind of teacher that she is. And so uh, Valerie Gaither uh, is also one of the awardees who uh, has, didn't get a chance to come here and make it. Uh, before I give you uh, wise out, let me do uh, just one more thing. Uh, some of you uh, have been in audiences where I have said this, and uh, 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 this is then to indicate I must have mean it because I'm here saying it again. And for those who, uh, who have not heard me say this, please. In your golden chain of love and friendship, please regard me as one link. For the stars in heaven could not be more true than my unchangeable heart to you. Hotel. Uh, first, I want to thank everybody uh, for staying this late. We knew uh, that it was going to be a long one tonight because we had people introducing for the first time. Uh, usually, Wise All did it, uh, uh, or, or he told me to do it. Then, then he told me to quit hogging the show <laughs> and share it. So this is how we did it uh, tonight, and this is probably how we're going to keep on doing it. First of all, um, these awards are heartfelt and uh, hopefully some indication of what the community feels about the people who have received them. Uh, this could not be done uh, without two organizations. One is the Network for the Advancement, no, for the Development, the Network for the Development of Children of African Descent. Uh, that's where you are. All of you who uh, got here and called me six, seven times, uh, and uh, I gave you—I always gave you about half of the message. Uh, so you had to call. Uh, this was my way of staying in touch with you. It had been a long time since I had talked to Naida. 
So I said, let me just hear that voice again. <laughs> Been a long time since I talked to Archie. And I just wanted to, that brotherhood thing. You understand what I'm talking about? Okay, good. All right, without further ado, shall we all say, Hotel. Hotel. Hotel.